We want to welcome everyone to the Nigerian Center Access to Capital Workshop. The title for today's class is Financing Your Business with the SBS Small Business Loans. Uh, before we get started, so we can make this a little bit more interactive, if you can chat in the chat box what city you're joining us from and the name of your business if you have one. Okay, um, ICDC, uh, ICPA. Oh, there's a feedback. Um, so let's see if it's everyone. Um, am I coming? Am I? Is an echo for everyone else? Or you can hear me? Okay, please let me know in the chat box. I see Maryland. I see Philadelphia. Um, is my sound okay? Can someone can please help me with that? Um, Simon, is my sound okay? Can you chat that in the chat box if my sound is okay? Sound is okay, excellent. So um, we are just going to get started officially. I, I wanna welcome everyone to the Nigerian Center Small Business Workshop. Today's topic is financing your small business with SBS Small Business Loans. We have a celebrity, uh, SMEs, subject matter expert, small business specialist with us from the SBA is an honor that we have um, our speaker today, Mr. Robert Johnson, who has generously donated his time and his resources to support us today, uh, giving us insights on how to access these resources. But before we get started, uh, before I bring our speaker up today, what I want to do is to use this opportunity to tell, um, for those who are just new to the Nigerian Center, and we're joining our workshops for the very first time to tell you about the Nigerian Center. I should add that this meeting is being recorded. If you object to be recorded, you may exit at this time. So that said, about the Nigerian Center. Um, Nigerian Center is located in Washington, DC. Uh, our mission um, is to provide connection to the Nigerian culture while offering financial inclusion and social justice opportunities for members of the Nigerian American community. I should add that while we are called the Nigerian Center, our services are not limited to Nigerians. We serve all diaspora groups uh, that walk through our doors and to reach out to us for services. Uh, the need for the Nigerian Center is apparent. Uh, across cultures, communities across the country, many people from other communities have a physical location as a community center. And oftentimes those centers are very instrumental in helping them to accelerate their journey into uh, the American experience and journey into financial inclusion. So while we celebrate the individual successes of the Nigerian American community, we cannot say the same for our community. Uh, we do not have up until now a community center. And this is the very first cultural immigrant community center for the Nigerian American community. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about our programs. Um, we have identified uh, a few areas of asset building to really help make our mission come into expression. Our number one is immigration. We do have a walk-in immigration clinic in Washington, DC, uh, without uh, cost to participant. Anyone can walk through our doors and get services and be seen by licensed attorneys. The service also is available for those who are outside of the Washington, DC area. However, there's a small fee associated to that of $50. Uh, which is a one-time fee, but you still get access to pro bono legal resources. We host uh, monthly Know Your Right immigration workshops as well uh, with uh, subject matter experts with immigration. Another aspect of our program is um, entrepreneurship and small business access to capital. The reason we do entrepreneurship and access to capital is because we realize for a lot of us in the uh, immigrant community, um, entrepreneurship uh, is not a luxury, it's not an aspiration, it's a survival strategy mechanism. Um, that is the only option that we have. And because of immigration barriers sometimes, access and capital could be difficult. So we have a lending program that provides loan to everyone, regardless of their immigration status, hence the reason for this workshop today. I want to talk about our home ownership program as well. We know that home ownership is the foundations and cornerstones for wealth and financial freedom in the United States and around the world. Um, so we have first-time owned by our programs providing resources for members of our community. 
we have language classes as well uh, for our community and those who want to connect to the Nigerian culture. I will teach in Aosa, Ibo, Yoruba. Our signature talk is called NC Talks. Uh, it's a cultural current affairs series that just spotlight issues that are pertinent to our community, um, whether they be culture, book lunches, cultural events that we host. So that said, I want to talk about our upcoming programs that you should be aware of. Um, on the 24th next week, we are having our own ownership program. Um, it's time to move from renting to owning. We have uh, Mr. Demola Shogunro will be presenting that workshop. If you haven't registered for that workshop, it's highly recommended. Um, if you would go to Nigerian Center forward slash dot org forward slash events, the links should be coming up in the chat box soon to register for that. Uh, next, after that, we're going to have our immigration workshop, which is um, family-based immigration. As we all know, this is one of the pathways for a lot of us uh, to citizenship and permanent residency, uh, the family-based option route. So we're getting um, um, lawyers as well as all the subject matter experts, uh, whether it is adoption-based, whether it is marriage-based, um, or relative sponsorship, uh, we're going to be covering that. Um, so this is a very, very important workshops. Uh, this is also open to U.S. citizens who are trying to sponsor their family members as well. Uh, we are currently accepting applications for our EBO class, our EBO program. Uh, it's a five weeks program from February to March. Um, sales for that program are currently ongoing right now. We still have limited spots available. We are this time about 51% to capacity. Um, so uh, we still have a few slots if you're interested in this program. This is a paid program, but it's subsidized at $199. So you can get this as well on our event page. Okay, I wanna talk about opportunities to get involved in the Nigerian Center programs. Our volunteer program is number one. I should mention that the Nigerian Center, it's 100%, um, well, with the exception of our lawyers, 100% uh, uh, volunteer-led team. Uh, so we are always asking for volunteers. And please, when you send a singular email to volunteers, do not be discouraged if we don't roll out the capex and offer you the dream job of your volunteer opportunity. Um, sometimes we may have the conversation going on for several weeks or months to help to find an ideal position for you. Um, so please do not give up. Please reach out and see what you can do to contribute and to support. To do so, you can go to the volunteer on the Get Involved. Um, the link should be coming up in the chat box very shortly uh, to see our volunteer opportunities. Or you can just send us an email at info at nigeriancenter.org um, indicating your interest to volunteer with us. I wanna talk about our community partners. Uh, we have, we hold quarterly communities partners meetings. And this is with community grassroots organizations from nonprofits, for-profits, media, faith-based, whatever community organization that has touch points with um, any immigrant community that we serve, we want you to be a community partners network. It's a listening session. It's an opportunity to hear directly from you to tell us areas of your community's pain points and how we can tell our programs according to that. Um, it is not, there's no elaborate requirement or process. Just go to our website on that community partners. Uh, you should be able to sign up to be a community partners. If you're not following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, as well as YouTube, please do so. Um, if you want to temporarily uh, get to your phone and log to your social media network, you have our full blessings to do so. Uh, our username is the Nigerian Center .org, uh, the Nigerian Center T H E uh, on Instagram. We are Nigerian Center on Facebook, Nigerian Center on LinkedIn, Nigerian Center on YouTube. Uh, so if you do not follow us, please do so. Donations. Um, our donations. Um, we ask you to please consider to donate to. Nigerian Center, we know that we all have various nonprofits that we support. We ask that you please consider having Nigerian Center to be a part of your nonprofit of support. As we said, Nigerian Center is a volunteer led team, so these are community efforts. I mean, you can be a part of that. I highly recommend 
that you consider becoming a recurring donate donor. And to do so, if you go to nigeriancenter.org forward slash donate, um, once you get to the PayPal, you can click the icon that says make this a recurring donation. Um, we ask that you do that for us for three months and, 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 and just kind of support us through this journey. Your contributions mean so, so much to us. And programs like this is brought to you by contributions from volunteers and donors like you. Okay, lastly, I want to mention that um, if you go to the media page on our website, you can access tonight's recording and the recording of our previous um, workshops, including our NC Talk series, cultural series that we have. We have great contents there. That said, I am so pleased and honored. Uh, Mr. Roderick, if you can please come back to the camera and microphone, this is the time. Um, we are so honored and so pleased to have our guest speaker today, Mr. Roderick Johnson from the SBA. He is the business opportunity specialist and is generously donated as his time to support us today. Is going to be going through the SBA um, resources for small businesses. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Mr. Roderick, welcome. All right. Thank you. Can you go ahead to the next to the um, slide presentation, please. Yes. So good I'm evening. Please, I'm putting that how are you, why you uh, are. Okay. All right, that's fine. So good evening. My name is Rod Roderick Johnson. I work for the Small Business Administration. I actually work for the Office of Government Contracting um, Business Development Office for women-owned small business programming. And so I'm a business opportunity specialist and my role is to get women-owned businesses certified, as well as economically disadvantaged women-owned businesses certified, as well as helping women-owned businesses receive financing for the new contracts that they receive from the federal government. So that's actually my role within the SBA. Prior to this role that I have now in the SBA, I actually worked in the Office of Investments and Innovations. I worked with small business investment companies, where they work with private equity firms. They raise about 75 million. The SBA gives them $2 for every dollar they raise up to 175 million. Those small business investment companies turn around and invest money into small businesses across the country. And then lastly, prior to that position, I was a lender relations specialist where I worked with 8A contractors. Those are companies that are um, certified by the SBA to participate in the program to get contracts awarded to them to help grow their business. So as you can see, with, within the SBA for the last um, five years, I've actually been working with various segments of the business community to ensure, A, one, they get certified to do business with the federal government, and two, in my mind, most importantly, get the financing that's needed to grow and sustain that business, all right? So this evening, go ahead to the next slide. This evening, we're actually going to talk about the financing options that you have for your business, whether you're a startup, you're growing, or you're a mature business, all right? So we're going to basically go through the life cycle of a business and the type of financing that's needed for each type of business. All right, next slide, please. All right, so there is a disclaimer. All right, so the information that's provided is actually provided in good faith. And we don't receive, we don't assume any responsibility for errors and or omissions, okay? Nor shall they be liable to you for any loss of profit in your current or future business. Now, if you need, legal or financial advice, then please go and seek that out from a professional like a CPA or a commercial attorney, all right? But that's the disclaimer for the presentation. All right, so let's get into the meat of the presentation. Next slide, please. So here we're gonna talk about the business financing stages, because there are stages. So we're gonna talk about starting your business, we're gonna talk about the lending requirements, the business plan essentials, traditional financing, um, how the Small Business Administration plays a role 
in all of those stages of your business. We're going to talk about bank loans, non-traditional financing like factors, okay? Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about factoring companies. And then, you know, questions to consider as you are applying for your loan. So next slide, please. And actually, I like, I like doing this presentation. So there are six stages. So you have your pre-startup, right? So right at that stage, you're thinking about starting the business. You're talking to your friends and family and your mentors and deciding whether or not you're going to start a business. All right, so now you've made the decision. And so under two years, you're considered a startup, all right? Now, hopefully you've raised money because typically how it's done is you've raised money from your family and friends or you've taken money out of your savings account to get that business started, which actually moves us into the next phase of undercapitalized firms. So what does that mean? All right, you've raised money from your family and friends, okay, or you've taken money out of your savings to fund the business. However, even in doing those things, generally your business is undercapitalized because when you win that new contract from the government, and we'll, I'm always talking contracts. So when you use that new con, win that new contract from the government, you know, there are things like mobilization costs, right? So you have to hire people, you have to purchase cell phones and laptops and things of that nature that actually get the work done. All right, so you haven't raised enough capital to be able to do those things. And then the other part is, once you win that contract and you start the work, you typically have to wait 90 days to get paid, okay? And so typically firms haven't raised enough capital to actually weather them through the first 90 days of not being paid on that contract. Now, of course, once you get through the first 90 days, typically, depending on the agency, they will pay you within 35 to 40 days, okay? That's typically what happens. Now, growth firms. Okay, so now you've started out, you, you've done $100,000 in revenue, all right? Because you started from ground zero. Then you've you know grown to 500. Now you've hit that million dollar phase, okay, in, in your growth spurt. And so now your company is beginning to, to grow, all right? And you see the, the upward curve. In, in the growth of your business. Now, some of you really may decide, I only wanna be a million dollar in revenue company. Others of you may decide that you wanna do 5 million. Others may decide that you wanna do $100 million in revenues and then go public. So it all depends on you know, what your desires are as to how fast you grow your business and if you're truly considered a growth firm. All right, mature firms are firms that have, you know, they've grown um, and typically, let's just say year 10, and that's typically around then, year 10, that now your revenues have begun to level off a bit. So let's just say that you've grown your business to about $10 million in revenue. And so in year 11, you may be 10 million, 250,000. Year 12, 10,750,000. So in other words, you're not really growing like a hockey stick. You know, you, you, your firm is pretty mature. You're not growing that much, but you are able to still remain, you know, profitable. But you're mature, okay? There's not much more room for you to grow. Firms with tax issues. Now, a lot of times, as firms are growing very rapidly in some industries, sometimes tax issues will come up because you haven't set aside um, money to pay estimated taxes on a quarterly basis. And I think it's very important that you get a CPA on board as part of your team. So let's talk about what your team should consist of. A CPA, a lawyer, a commercial banker, okay, and your commercial insurance rep. Those are the, the four most important people that you need to have on your team, okay, as you are running your firm, because they're going to be the four people that actually keep you out of trouble. All of those people 
have various ways of mitigating your risk. So let's talk about that a minute. What do I mean by that? So your CPA is mitigating risk. Why? So that you're not exposed to paying more in taxes than you need to pay. So typically they're going to file your taxes on a cash basis versus an accrual basis. Meaning on a cash basis, cash in, cash out. So you earn the revenue, it comes, you collect it. And then when a bill comes in, you go ahead and pay cash for it. On the accrual basis, what happens is you'll recognize the revenue, but you'll also recognize the expense within the same period that you collected that revenue. On the cash basis, you may collect your revenue in the first quarter, but you may not actually pay the expenses associated with that revenue until quarter two or three, all right? With, which means that you may overstate for a couple of quarters your net profit. On the accrual basis, you recognize those expenses in the same quarter that you've earned your revenue. So therefore, the likelihood of your net income being overstated is uh, very minimal to none. All right, I gave you a lot of information there that you probably didn't need, but I thought I'd go, go through that with you. The two most common mistakes that are made by business owners is not, as I mentioned, not properly funding the company at the inception and as the business grows, not paying payroll taxes. That's the other thing, payroll taxes. The, the business is growing very rapidly and you need cash. And so, and so instead of paying the payroll taxes when you should, again, on a quarterly basis, you forego that, hoping that at some point at the end of the year, you're gonna be able to make things whole. But a lot of times what happens is you wind up owing payroll taxes. And if you do it long enough, then your business is going to be shut down, right? So just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. All right, so starting your business. We all have heard of now the LLC, the LLP, the C Corp, the Yes Corp, and the sole proprietor. Now let's go in terms of risk. Nobody should be, in, should be a sole proprietor anymore. Why? Because your personal assets are at risk, okay? So if I sue your company and you're a sole proprietorship, and if you own a home, a car, um, Quite, frank, uh, um, quite frankly, I can take your assets to make me whole um, if I sue you, all right? So you don't wanna become, you don't wanna start out as a sole proprietorship because your personal assets are at risk. Let's look at an LLC, LLP, C Corp, and S Corp, okay? Those entities that I just named adds a layer of protection. Okay, so if you get sued, you may get sued at the company level first. And so those assets that are within the company would be liquidated first, and hopefully that would take care of your liability. And then you don't even have to worry about your personal assets being impacted in any way. So with an LLC, you can have a single member LLC, or you can have an LLC that has managing members, okay? Or you can have a managing member and a general partner within an LLC, all right? Typically, LLPs are law firms, okay? Primarily um, are LLPs, C-Corps. Um, you don't have too many C-Corps that are out there. But C corps, you know, have shareholders. Typically, there's common stock and preferred stock shareholders in a C corp, and with an S corp, all it means is that the taxes are paid at the individual tax rate versus the corporate rate. Okay, so if your business has a net profit under the S corp of hundred thousand dollars, typically you would multiply that by 40% because that's what your state, local, and income taxes come out to be at the end of the day at about 40%. So you would take 
100,000 multiply that by 40%, the company's net profit would actually be 60,000 and you would take the other 40,000 and actually that money is used to pay the taxes that I just named, federal, state, and local, local um, income taxes, all right? So that's really the difference between an S Corp and a C Corp, all right? With a C Corp, you get hit with double taxation because you pay taxes on the earnings of the company. And then if there are any distributions or dividends, then you pay taxes on those dividends or bonuses, all right? Now, the employee identification number, EIN, you get that from the IRS. Frankly, you just go online to the IRS and you can get an EIN number as you start your business. Now, your business license. Every state requires you generally, well, I should say most states require you to have a business license, all right? And so you need to do that. In Maryland, it's the State Department of Assessment and Taxation. You have the same thing in Northern, well, in Virginia. And then DC, it's called the DCRA, okay? That's where you go to get your business license. Um, you have your employ employee verification. You know, you have to have them fill out the I-9 form. And you got to, you know, U USCIS, the U.S. Citizens and Immigration Services to make sure that the people are here legally to work. All right, then you heard me talk about the insurance agent. What is he doing? He's mitigating your risk. How does he do that? Let's say that you're a doctor, okay? A doctor has malpractice insurance that costs a lot of money. If you are a CPA, um, the CPA has what we call errors and omissions. If you are a barber or a hairstylist, right? You need business liability insurance because if someone gets out of the chair and they slip on the floor and fall and they sue you, that's what your business liability insurance will cover if you get sued, all right? And notice that I said that it's your business. So hopefully you are either an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLC, or an LLP so that none of your personal assets are at risk. Okay, and then you have your minority classifications, right? So I just named some. You have your 8A, you have your disadvantaged, right? Um, Women-owned small business. You have your service-disabled, veteran-owned small business. You have your minority business enterprise, you have your certified business enterprise, and there are a whole lot of minority classifications out there. So make sure that if you qualify for any of those minority classifications, that you have them on your capability statement. All right, next slide, please. Is the business bankable? Well, if you have no personal credit history, okay, Experian, Equifax, okay? Experian, Equifax, and what's TransUnion? Those are the three main credit reporting agencies. You need to have personal credit history. No business credit history, Dun & Bradstreet. Are you registered with Dun & Bradstreet? Poor personal credit. Well, typically 620 and below is considered poor personal credit, all right? No tangible collateral. What's tangible collateral? Cash, marketable securities, residential or commercial real estate, something you can touch and feel, all right? No prior experience in the business. So that's like me decide waking up tomorrow morning and deciding that I wanna run a Starbucks when all of my experience and education is in finance, okay? so. The banker's going to look at me kind of funny when I have no personal credit history, no business credit history, or I have poor personal credit. I don't have any tangible collateral to offer and to add injury to insult, right? Or insult to injury, excuse me, that I have no prior experience in the business that I'm trying to start up, all right? So bankers look at these things. 
Also, if any of you remember PPP and you heard all this noise about minority firm were unable to take advantage of PPP, well, you know why? Because they hadn't filed the tax returns in one or more years, okay? So if you're not filing your business or personal tax returns on time, that's an issue. You're not gonna be able to get credit for, or financing, I should say, for your business, all right? Now, we all know that the business tax returns are due when? March 15th. So I hope you business owners out there are pulling your information together to be able to give to your CPA to be able to file your business taxes on time. For your personal taxes, um, I think this year it's instead of April 15th, because I think that falls on the Saturday, and I think they're giving you three days extra to file. So that's going to be on April 18th. So again, I hope that you're pulling your information together, you know, any W-2s, any charitable contributions that you've made, or anything else where you can, you know, offset your tax liability. The important thing is to file these documents on time. Here is something. People are not paying their federal and state and local taxes. Unbelievable. The way to get around that is to be able to pay, you know, estimated taxes for all three on a quarterly basis. So that at the end of the year, you're not looking at this huge tax liability, and then you're going to have to go on a payment plan with the IRS. Okay. Now, as the slide says, no financing will be found with this type of profile. It just won't. All right, let's go to the next, next slide, please. FICO scores. Is this business, is this type of business bankable? You know, to be frank with you, I need to change the top one. We all think that a 700 FICO score is good. Wrong. Most bankers are now looking at a minimum FICO score of 730. Okay, not 700, 730. All right, now you have tangible collateral. You own a condo, you own a house, you know, and now you have tangible collateral. You have prior experience in the business that you're starting. All right, your company is showing profitability. Don't be like Donald Trump and think that you're going to, you know, have all these losses to offset income. Um, the average Joe Smo, you know, really can't get away with that for too long, okay? Your business needs to show a net profit. You need to retain earnings in your net profit, okay? Because if you have a negative net worth, okay, or negative equity in your company, typically your banker is going to say that you're technically bankrupt because you don't have any equity in your company. You haven't retained earnings because what you should your balance sheet should look like there should be in order for your business to grow there needs to be a combination of equity and debt. Now we know that debt is cheaper than equity, right? Because you can get debt at around well these days nine percent. Equity costs you it's like eighteen to twenty percent. So. Make sure that you're retaining earnings. You're collecting your receivable. You heard me mention it earlier. Within 35 to 40 days, right? The business is showing year-over-year -year sales growth, which you heard me talk about, right? You started out at 100,000. You're up to 500,000. You've grown to a million. Now you're at 5 million, 10 million, right? Bankers are looking to see that your sales are growing. What is adequate working capital? And people throw that term around. I need, I need working capital to grow. What it means is that as your business is growing, you need money to, let's just say, purchase inventory. When you sell the inventory on credit, then you've created an accounts receivable. And then what you need to do is collect that accounts receivable, like the prior bullet says, within 30 to 40 days. And that receivable is now converted to cash. So that's what we're talking about with working capital, all right? Both your personal and business tax returns are filed on time, okay? 
and that you don't owe any business or personal taxes to Uncle Sam. This is the type of profile that's bankable, all right? But remember, the FICO score should probably be 730 or above. Next slide, please. All right, lending requirements. Do you have good character? Do you have good credit? Is the business cash flowing? Does the business have capacity to grow? Do you have the cap necessary capital to grow? Lines of credit, term loans, okay? Do you have the necessary capital? Do you have the necessary collateral? Accounts receivable, inventory, um, cash that can be taken as collateral or a lien on your home? Do you have the commitment and the discipline to do the business day in and day out? Okay, well, I tell you what, when you take out a loan from a bank, that kind of forces you to have the discipline to get up out of bed and do the business day in and day out because you got to pay that money back, okay? And then there's just common sense, all right? Are you operating the business in a manner that it's on a growth curve, growth in revenues, growth in net profits, and you're managing your expenses well, all right? So next slide, please. The lender focus, and I've mentioned it, your business and personal credit. Is it good? For your personal credit, there's a done score. Typically your, your um, oh, excuse me, your paydex score, excuse me. Dun and Bradstreet furnishes what they call a paydex score. The paydex score typically needs to be in a bank. Some banks will say 75, others will say 80 and above. That's what your Dun score should be, okay? So if you're not a part of Dun and Bradstreet, sign up, okay? And make sure that your bank is reporting the business credit card that you have to Dun and Bradstreet. Does the business generate cash flow to make payments? Okay. If you're showing losses on your income statement, then you're not showing income to service debt. Okay. Remember, I said you can't do the Donald Trump way and, and um, continually have losses because it catches up with you like it has now, right? Um, are your cash flow projections realistic? Right. And you say, well, what do I base my cash flow projections on? You've been in business five years, then you take the average of those five years. Okay. And that's a pretty good start for having realistic projections because now you're projecting things off of actual numbers. Okay. Is there a collateral? Does your home have enough equity in it? Let's say. So a combination between your spouse, house, right, and your children, is there enough um, collateral to secure the loan, okay? So that's what the banker is looking for, and we tease and say house and spouse is what we take as collateral. All right, understanding the risk. What type of risk are you in your business? Are you a low risk, high risk, medium risk? What's a high risk? A high risk is a person that has a 455 personal FICO score. And I've met some people in the last five years that have a 450 FICO score. What does that say to me? You're just, you know, a few steps ahead of the repo man, right? Where they're going to repossess your house, they're going to repossess your car with a 450 FICO score. So that's a high risk. A company that has a, a paydex score of 50 was telling me that you don't really pay your bills on time. So that's a high risk. What's a low risk, a 730 FICO score, a, a paydex score of 85 or 90. Your company showing net profits, revenues are growing, you're retaining earnings in your business. See, that's a low risk. That's what bankers like to see, all right? All right, next slide, please. Who are your clients? Do you know them? Are you a business, a B2B, do you sell to the government? Do you sell to the consumer? You know, who are your clients? Are your products, are you a product or a service related business, right? Service related, CPA, attorney, bankers, 
right? So are you a service or are you product oriented? Okay. And then service related government contract. So businesses and consumers. All right, next slide, please. Basically, know your customers and who they are and know who your best customers are. Because see, you may start out selling to commercial businesses where generally you're gonna have high profit margins, but the problem is you may not be able to collect from them on time. So then you, so then you begin to sell to the government and then you say, oh boy, the government is my best client. I do the work, I submit my invoice, and they pay me in 30 to 35 days, okay? And so that may wind, the government may wind up, whether it's federal, state, or municipal governments, they may wind up being your best customers because A, it's very rare that they're gonna go bankrupt like a regular commercial business does. And so you know that you're going to eventually get paid. But the other thing is they typically pay by clockwork once they have your company in their system, all right? What are the business goals? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to grow it big enough so you can sell it? Are you trying to grow it so that you can have something to leave to your, you know, your wife and children? What are your goals, okay? What's the future of the industry that you're in? Well, you know, Ford, the Ford Motor Company can, can't afford to sell Model T cars anymore, right? because that's just out of style. So now what are they doing? They're selling hybrids or they're selling what do they call them, EV, EV automobiles. So what's the future in your industry? Now they're saying that gas stoves are passe. I've just read that yesterday in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington, Washington Post. I'm not so sure about that. I got a gas stove. I like the gas stove versus the electric stove. But anyway, you got to keep up with What's the future in your industry? What are the risks in your business? Okay, you have to consider that. If you're a doctor and you're a cardiovascular surgeon, well, there's a high risk in your business because you may cut a valve and the person dies on the table. That's a huge risk. And so now you have to go against your professional liability insurance. Here's that insurance agent again you know, mitigating that risk for you. All right, what market does it serve? Are you, is your market national? Is your market international? Or is your market right here in the DMV? Okay, what's your market? Where is your market? And then how will you market to your potential customers? Is it by the word of mouth? Is it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Okay, it could be all of those things combined, all right? But you need to decide how will you market to your customers. Next slide, please. Ah, the business plan continue. We need financial statements, a sales forecast, cash flow projection, profit and loss. Here's a big one, the sources and uses of the cash, okay? So let's just say you're going to the bank for $100,000 and you've moved into this new office condo that's 1,000 square feet. And let's just say that you're a marriage counselor, right? So you got to have a place to do counseling. So for people to come and lie out on the couch, right? And you can hear their problems. But, but you need to outfit the office. So where are going to be the sources and uses of the cash? So the sources, part of your sources may be your savings account. So you may put $25,000 of your own of your own money in. That's a source of cash, all right? Then you may get a grant for, you know, from the Associate American Psychology Association. So you may get a grant for, you know, $25,000. That's another source of cash. And then you know, you may have family and friends put in another 25,000. So that's a hundred, okay? So what's gonna be the use of those cash, of that cash? Well, I'm gonna use that money. I need to buy, you know, a couch to have my people sit in when I'm counseling them, desk, chairs, you know, things like that. 
And you need to put by each one of those line items how much they cost, and they both most must add up to 100%, okay? Then you need a balance sheet. Assets minus, minus liability equals what? Equity. Then you have a break-even analysis. If I have this much in sales and this much in, in expenses, you know, do I break even? Or as they call it, zero-based budgeting. And then you need to have notes to your financials explaining how you came up with the numbers that you came up with. And it might be that you came up with those numbers from industry, you know, industry magazines. There's something called the US Industrial Guide that had, and it's in the library. A lot of your banks have it too, because a lot of banks when they're doing an analysis for your company will use the US Industrial Guide to find out what's going on, what's the latest in your business. And in terms of operating profit margin, net profit margin, your um, gross profit margins, they're going to be looking at that guide as a guide post to see that you're operating within your industry standards. So it's called the U.S. Industrial Guide, and it's in the library. All right, next slide, please. Traditional financing, right? Lines of credit, term loans, equipment loans, asset-based loans, and then you have the SBA guarantee loan, 7A, 504, disaster loans. Like right now, California is a disaster, right? Literally, because they've had all this rain out there. And so houses are, you know, floating out into the Pacific Ocean, mudslides, okay? So they would come to the SBA to get a disaster loan. Now, your business is growing. You need a line of credit. Or you need, you're buying a backhoe and a tractor for your construction company. Well, you need, you need to finance that over three or four years. Okay, you're not going to use a line of credit for that. An equipment loan. Okay, you may need to buy a Xerox or an IBM, you know, copying machine. So you get a, an equipment loan. And that's that base loan. If you're a government contractor, you're using primarily the accounts receivable as the collateral for that, you know, for that loan, all right? So that's, those are the traditional means of financing. Next slide, which should be the non-traditional means? Ah, the SBA. Okay, so let's talk about the microloans that go up to a maximum of 50,000. They're real small, okay? Then you have the 7A program. The 7A program goes up to $5 million, <laughs> excuse me. And depending on the size of the loan, when the bank makes the loan, it gets a 75% guarantee. So if your business goes belly up, then the SBA will stand behind 75% of the loan to make the bank whole. And then the bank comes after you for the remaining 25%, okay? That's really how that works. The 504 program is when you're buying an office condo, an office building, um, a backhoe, a tractor trailer, a tractor. So in other words, it's used for fixed assets, okay, which I just named. We talked about the microloans that are only 50,000. Most bankers don't even want to do those loans because they're so small, you can't make you know any money on it. But they're out there for you, okay? Next slide, please. Ah, what's needed to get a bank loan? I need to update this. Three years of business financial statement. So now we're going to be looking at 2022, 2021, and 2020 for both personal and business tax returns. Okay. Since we're in really the first month of the year, we don't need interim financial statements. We just need your year end financial statement. Then we're going to need your accounts receivable and accounts payable aging as of December 31st, 2022. Okay, that comes right out of QuickBook. And then financial projections typically for three years to show how you're going to pay back the loan. Now, the one thing that you need to know is that you're going to need to complete a personal financial statement that shows your personal assets and the liability 
against those assets, right? Meaning you own a home on the Gold Coast in Washington, DC by Rock Creek Park. The home is a million five, that's the asset. The liability against that asset is that you have a mortgage for a million dollars, okay? Well, if we were to take 1.5 million minus a million, that's 500,000, that would be the equity, okay? So you, you need to have enough collateral to cover the amount of money that you're borrowing. And, you know, that personal financial statement is used to find out, really, what is your lifestyle like? So you're running the business, but you take money out of the business, you bonus yourself, let's just say $100,000. So that should show up on your, on your personal financial statement. Now, what did you do with that $100,000? Did you go out and buy yourself a Maserati, a depreciating asset? Or did you put it in a mutual fund? Did you put it in the stock market? Did you go to Navy Federal and put it in a 5% 15-month CD, right? Again, to hedge against the risk in the stock market, all right? So we're looking at, what you, your personal financial statement gives us a clue as to your lifestyle, all right? But you had to obviously fill one out to get a bank loan. And then there's the SBA guarantee. But the SBA guarantee is typically 75%. For the 504 loan, it's 50%. For the 504 loan, you put down 10%, the bank takes... Yeah, the owner puts down 10, the bank takes 50, and the SBA takes 40%. That's how that works. All right. So next slide, please. So that's your SBA guarantee. <clears throat> All right, CDFIs. You hear about CDFIs like Industrial Bank, um, City First Bank. Some of our credit unions are certified development financial institutions. Now look at these statistics. Four in 10 small businesses have less than one million in annual revenue denied, right, financing, and half were rejected at big banks. Why? Because of the credit. It can be hard to get a loan because you live in an underserved neighborhood, okay? So here's where financial as a community development financial institution comes into place. They understand that your business is operating in an area where it's hard to get a loan. And so they will try to find a way to do your deal. Okay. So it's better to try to work with a CDFI, like a credit union or a micro lender or a community bank versus people seem to always want to run to J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank to get your business loan. No, because your business may not be large enough to work with those financial institutions. So the place to go is to a community bank or to a credit union that tend to be more friendly to smaller businesses. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. And we actually, we should be coming up toward the end. I think two more slides. There we go. Your microloans. They're great for startups, easy to qualify for. Um, and that's really the takeaway for microloans. The interest rates may be a little higher, but they're easier to get. And they're character-based, meaning they look at your FICO score. You got a 730. You get the money. It's that simple. Next slide, please. Factoring. How many people have gone to a factor, right? Where what they're really doing is buying your accounts receivable and then advancing you 90% of your accounts receivable. They're responsible for collecting it. But what they're doing is they're giving you 90% of your accounts receivable up front. And in exchange, they're probably charging you like 15% to 18% interest on that money, okay? 
So that's what really factoring is all about. You can't really get a bank loan, so you got to go to a factor where they're literally um, fleecing you of the profits out of your business. All right. But sometimes factors are needed to get your business going. All right. Next slide, please. Now, here's some questions to consider. Do I really need financing or can my bank, uh, can my business generate enough cash flow where I don't need outside financing? If you do need outside financing, what will it do for your business? Will it help your business grow? Okay, which is really hopefully what the financing will do for your business. Are you willing to provide a personal guarantee? Because if you're not, you're not going to get the loan. It's that simple. So always be prepared to fill out a personal financial statement and offer a 100% personal guarantee. Do you have collateral? Okay. Do you understand the terms and conditions of your loan? Do you have a competent CPA and a lawyer and an insurance person? These are the people that are going to keep you out of trouble. Are you, we talked about it. Are you using Facebook, MySpace, Instagram, Twitter, you know, LinkedIn? Are you using social media to promote your business? And then you see at the bottom here, do you have all of your certifications, right? Certified business enterprise, minority business enterprise, 8A, woman minority owned business, veteran business service disabled veteran business, and there are a ton of others. Do you have all these certifications to help you get contracts to grow your business? This should be the last slide. Go ahead to the next one. And this is my information. So if you have questions, you can call me. That's it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roderick Johnson. Do we have any questions, any comment? Um, please, if you have any questions, you can use the raising hands option. Uh, so we will call you. Uh, you may also unmute yourself if you have questions for Mr. Jensen. Good evening, um, everybody. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, my question is somewhat of a question, but um, I'm going to just throw it out here. Uh, if you received an SBA loan, uh, let's say two years ago, of over 100000 and you want to request um, additional funding, how do you go about doing that? All right. So when you say an SBA loan, was it an economic injury disaster loan or was who made the loan? Did the bank make the loan or did the SBA make the loan directly? SBA made the loan directly. And I know it's not a, a disaster uh, loan uh, because this individual already received that. Um, this is, unfortunately, I'm not even sure the the name of it, but it was 150000 That's the exact amount. See, the, S, the only time the SBA really lends directly is the economic injury disaster loan. Otherwise, you have to go to a bank to get an SBA loan. Okay. So you got to find out who actually made the loan. Understood. But, but you did ask the question, can you get another SBA loan? As long as that sucker hasn't been charged off, right, the one that you have now, because there are people that have had SBA loans in the past and, and the SBA had to wind up charging it off, that happens, you have zero chance, all right? Well, let's just say you have an SBA back loan and you need additional money. Yes, you can come back and get an SBA back loan as long as the first one is in good standing. Yes, you can to answer your question. But you really should check to see if it's an idle or if it's an um, SBA back bank loan. 
really appreciate your answer. I can unequivocally tell you that this individual's SBA is in good standing. In fact, it's um, paid through automatically through the uh, government website. I'm forgetting, uh, I think it's pay.com, but it's it's in good standing and you just really answered a great question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for that, Celia. I have, I have a question. Sure. Quick, quick, quick question. So the, the loan that comes with uh, backed by um, a real estate, like you want to buy an office condo, do you need to back that with your personal um, home as well or your personal stuff if you're buying a condo for the business? Okay, so I'm going I'm to throw a number out. So let's just say the office condo costs a million dollars, okay? You have two ways to finance that using the SBA. So you can use the 504 program, which I described, which is what I would recommend, okay? Where you're only putting down 10%. The SBA um, is coming in at 40%, and then the bank, is lending you 50%. That's really the proper way to finance that deal, okay? Now, do you have to sign a personal guarantee? Yes, but they're not gonna take a lien. They're not gonna put a lien on your house or ask you to do an assignment of your, let's say you have stocks and bonds. They're not gonna ask you to do an assignment of your stocks and bonds to secure the loan for as collateral. The real estate, that you're purchasing will actually serve as the collateral for the loan. Okay. So no, they're not going to that, that means if the person doesn't own, if they if they don't own uh, a personal resident, they can still buy, let's say, one uh condo unit for say two hundred thousand or a hundred thousand. They can still buy it without owning yeah. their own house. Without yeah, you can still buy it without having to own personal real estate, you sure okay. can. Now, the okay. business should be very strong. Okay, let, let me not kid you. The business needs to be very strong in terms of mm. it's growing, and its sales is growing, and you're showing net profit, okay? You need to really mm. be, those two things need to be showing. If you don't have personal collateral, then yeah, you need to have strong net profits and you know, your sales are consistently growing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, do we have any other questions? Now, I'll tell you, I'm big on businesses buying real estate, okay? Um, frankly, let's just say you're in a district. And if you know Georgia Avenue, in some of the places in the city where let's just say you have an all state operating on the ground floor and then you have two apartments upstairs in that same building. I love it because you can have the all state, but then you can rent out the apart two apartments upstairs as income, as additional income for your business. It's called a mixed use commercial property. I love I love financing those type of property, right? Because you, 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 yeah, you get income. They help pay. They help pay for that commercial mortgage. Mm -hmm. I wish more businesses would look for that type of commercial property. Okay. You said it's called mixed use. Yes. And Mr. Johnson, you like really um, touched a sensitive part because I used to live right there at Georgia Avenue Petworth, oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. right in that building in 1999. And I wish my brain was what it is now, but um, <laughs> every time somebody says something about that area, I just, uh, I, I get a, a, rem a nostalgia feeling, but thank you so much. I'm taking notes. That's why I had to ask you about that mixed use um, property. All right. So on Kennedy Street, I think it's like Fifth and Kennedy. All right. So I had a customer 
he had a four unit building, okay? So what he did is he used to live in it himself and he taught piano lessons, okay? So he lived on, in the unit on the left side of the building on the ground floor. On the right side of the ground building is where he taught piano lessons, all right? So there's his income from the business. Then upstairs, the two units upstairs on the left and the right, he rented those two properties out to, to individuals. Okay, you gotta love it. The business is paying the mortgage, but he's also getting income from two renters upstairs and he lives in the fourth unit downstairs. What a way to go. You got a place to live, you got a place for your business, and you're generating income from two units upstairs. I hope I've given you guys an idea. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, uh, Mr. Johnson. Can we all give Mr. Robert Johnson a virtual round of applause for his wealth of wisdom uh, with us today? Uh, thank you so much, sir. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Look, anytime is my, well, let me give you my phone number. It's 202. 617-4435 if you guys have you know questions particularly if you want to buy commercial real estate in DC Maryland or Virginia um do not sleep on owning commercial real estate please don't I, I, I guess I'll part with that since you guys don't have any questions of me thank you so much and I should also mention that DC just launched the Commercial Property Acquisition Fund in Washington, D.C. as well. And there are a couple of options at the state level. Uh, if you can quickly touch on that, because some states has property, commercial property acquisition funds. Um, does SBA kind of co-fund with that or support that, or you have to go that differently? Can you get some money from state and some money from SBA? All right, so what you do, no, so what happens is the state, so the state will give you some funds, okay? Then you go to the bank, and then what the bank will do is come to the SBA for a guarantee, ah. all right? So let's just say the 504, which I just talked about, then the SBA will come in at 40%. The state money that you can, that you can get, you can use that as your down payment. So instead of you coming out of pocket with 10%, you can use the state's money as your down payment. Wow. All right. Yes. Or you can use the SBA 7A program where the SBA will guarantee yes, 75 percent of the loan and you use the state money to come up with your 20 or 25 percent down payment. All right. So that state money is actually critical because that way you don't have to come out of your pocket for the down payment. Wow. Right. And so since you don't have to do that, then the money that you would use for the down payment, now you can use your money for leasehold improvements. Right. If you want to knock a few walls down or buy furniture, whatever it is you want to do to the property, you can use the money that you saved by using the state and local government's money. Now you can use your money for improvements. I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Wow. And I'm encouraging you guys to go get the money and buy the commercial property if, if you business can afford it. Okay. Excellent. It'll be it'll be the best thing you've ever done, believe me. Excellent. Thank you so so much. I want to cover a few portion of the micro loan you mentioned. Um, so talk about Nigerian Center micro loan programs that we do have. So if I know we have this meeting cut off time for. 7.30, so we are past time, so I'm going to have a few minutes to quickly cover that. Uh, so the Nigerian Center, we do have a credit building loan, and also we do have micro loans that we provide to entrepreneurs. And the beauty of our program is the, uh, uh, the underwriting is done by CDFIs, so uh, we don't actually go through with immigration status. So those who are still in between status or those who have zero credit, uh, because we know it takes a while for people to come here and establish personal and business credit, you can actually take this loan to establish such a credit 
uh, for yourself and for your business. So what does this entail? So uh, our credit building and startup loan um, is started $500 and it goes to $25,000. Um, it is six zero percent to six percent declining basis, meaning as you pay off the loan, whatever is left is what you're going to be making deductions on, um, in terms of your um, interest with that. The zero percent, uh, some special loan exists for women-owned businesses, uh, so follow up with us with that to connect you with that. Um, we start the average loan for less than five thousand dollars for brand new businesses. These businesses don't have to be incorporated. Yes, it could be a business idea. Uh, to get started. The requirements include uh, your government ID, social security. Uh, for those who don't have social security numbers, we can go have the tax identification numbers for that. There is no application fee. There's no co collateral required for this. As I said, it's open to new businesses. Um, at, at this time, our focus is on Washington, D.C. metro area businesses. Those outside of the DMV area can still reach out to us. to look. We can look for options for them but primarily now we are serving those within the Washington DC area. Um, we do have uh, some form of a requirement in terms of social requirement um, that we're gonna to explain to you once you reached out to us for this program. Um, and the small business loan goes up to 12, six months to 10 years. So once you go to the Nigerian Center Small Business Program, uh, before you choose the option for $250,000 loan, I just wanna let you know what the requirements are. That goes up to 12% up on 5% fixed interest rate. The requirements are a little bit more than the micro loans. Um, and it's actually geared towards existing businesses. So maybe brick and mortar businesses. Uh, after being around for about two, three years, um, we're gonna ask for both personal and business um, tax re returns. Collateral will be required, and this includes um, house, cash in the bank. Uh, Mr. Johnson went through it. There's a $50 fee for applying for this loan, closing fee up to 3%, and you will have to submit a business plan. So this is for established businesses. So for everyone, whether they are new to the country, they're trying to establish personal credit, we ask that you consider the micro loans. For those who are trying to start a business, we may have to nine to five. We ask that you also consider the micro loan. Um, if you can make the link available, it is nigeriancenter.org for slash small business. You will fill the small business application form. We we'll try to get back to you within 24 or 48 hours at most uh, to proceed with the process. Um, that said, you are going to receive an evaluation form link um, in the chat box. Please fill that out. Um, we are also asking you for suggestions in terms of topics that we think we should cover. Uh, let us know. So I want to thank every single one. I want to thank our speakers once again. Please join us on our social media pages. Reach out to us for volunteer opportunities. Go to our media page on our website for previous recording of our workshop, including this one. If you're not currently donating to Nigerian Center as your nonprofit of choice, please consider doing so today. And we also ask that you consider becoming a recurring donor. Uh, to support the Nigerian Center's work. That said, thank you very much. We are all released into greatness. All right. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you. Excellent.